yeah, so the last time I did a talk for this group uh, was election night 2016. Yeah, I know, it was weird watching electric, uh, but here's the good news. My talk was the one thing that night that actually maybe was positive because a couple people had fun. Um, so it, it's great to be back. Um, uh, Calvin was so desperate, he asked me back and said, hey, what can you talk about today? And I said, well, I haven't done any of the things that you're interested in. I don't, I'm skeptical about AI. Um, I'm the only one, I think. And uh, I teach beginners, mostly. I teach some other stuff, too, but mainly I teach beginners. Um, but I said, here's this one weird thing I've been working on. And he was like, okay, well, you could, you could try that. So here's the situation I was in. I am the primary freshman instructor for computer science at IUPUI. What? Yep, there we go. Um, the, the school spirit is overwhelming in here. Uh, and so I'm the one you have to meet first to get through. Uh, they call me the level one boss character. Um, and so you got to get through me to learn how to program in CS1. And then in CS2, we go back through, you know, C, C++, Java, Vim. We do Vim. They love it because everybody thinks they're a hacker. Um, so I teach CS1, CS2, and senior level game programming. Um, I use multiple languages. I convinced the university to move to Python two weeks before MIT moved to Python in their CS1. My, my department chair was furious at me. He said, this is too risky. And then I took in the paper, look, we just beat MIT. And he's like, yeah, whatever, don't fall on your face. <laughs> Uh, but like most uh, freshman CS professors, I have fallen in love with Python as a first language. It's a great early language to teach for a lot of reasons, because um, I don't care about language. I want to teach algorithms. I want to teach problem solving. Um, but if we don't have a language, they don't believe it's real. So you have to have some sort of a language to implement in. And like many, we have chosen Python, um, because it gets out of the way. It looks a lot like the algorithm. Um, it's reasonably multi-platform. Um, and kids can have success. So I like that. If they have success, they'll keep, they'll keep working. Uh, for the most part, Python has been a great fit. But there's one issue in modern programming instruction that's a big deal. And that is, you know, some of us <coughs> old people remember when all code was written on the command line. And, you know, as before, we had these, you know, fancy graphic interfaces. Um, and so we still tend to teach a lot of our coding with command line interfaces. The reason is not because we're old. The reason is because that's way easier. Okay, tell me about Visual Basic. Really? Yeah, Visual Basic is like, yeah, my program's all done except for the coding. Um, so no, 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 no. We know that it still makes sense to teach on the command line, but to our students, they will always ask, when will I learn how to write real programs? And what they mean by real, honestly, because I'm like, it's real, it's working. Okay, it's only working because I helped you, but we'll go with that. It's real, well, why is it not real? Well, it's not on my phone. It doesn't have a visual interface, and you have to have Python to run it. So I want to be able to write programs that I can show my grandma on Thanksgiving break. That's really what they mean. Do you, you, you hear me? And I'm like, well, great. Um, that's a complicated thing. Among other things, we, the way we run our, our classes, I teach in a big lecture hall. We have labs, but they're different labs. Some are Mac labs, some are Windows labs. A lot of students prefer to bring their own device. So I've got to support every device under the sun. Fine. Python should be OK. Uh, we did start switching to Python Anywhere, which I really love as a teaching environment because I don't have to install it. Um, I give them, they can take the free account, is more than enough. They write their code on there. We can, they can link up their TA so we can support them online. It's beautiful. My lab people love me because I never bother them in that class. Um, so that's pretty great. But today's beginners think you have to have a GUI, preferably a web or mobile GUI, in order for it to be real. Um, 
so like lots of people, I'm like, okay, fine, we can do GUIs in Python. But you know, there's only one built in. Um, and so unless I want to deal with pip and environments and all kinds of other nonsense, I kind of got to go with the one UI that's built into Python. That would be, of course, to Kinter. Do you know this beauty? Don't you worry, I'll show you. Um, so Tkinter is a library built on top of the TK, which was a user interface library on top of TCL. Um, so it's been around forever. The good news is it's lightweight. It's reasonably straightforward to use. And my favorite part, it's built into all major Python installs. So I'm like, cool, I'll do GUIs in TK. That'll make them happy. And it did. Relatively simple design, it's built in. It's not pretty, but it mostly works. Um, here, I'll show you, I'll actually, you know somebody's stupid when they try live coding in front of you, right? <laughs> Python 3. Okay, um, here's, what, here's my favorite thing about TK Enter, because if I was trying to do this in Java or C++, I would not do this live. Um, so let's do uh, from TK enter import star. Don't you judge me. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I always do it this way. Um, app gets TK. Oh. It popped up! Oh, that's so exciting. It really is. If you've ever tried to G teach GUIs before, it requires a lot of patience. Because in Java, Right? Swing app in Java, public static void mainstream args, and we haven't even gotten to the graphical part. I mean, you're doing 25 things before you ever see this little thing pop up. So this is exciting, and it gets better. LBL out gets label, app text gets, hi there. Oh dear, don't worry, it's fine. Remain calm, I'm a trained professional. The grid command throws it on there. OK, it's ugly. And it's so small that I may not actually be able to move it without hitting one of the icons. But we'll, we'll play with it. OK, so that's cool, right? Two lines of code, and we've got a working-ish GUI. Let's do more with it. Um, TXTN gets entry. App uh, no, you can't do that. TXT in dot grid. And there's my TXT in. There it is. It's a cute little text box. And now we'll do a button. We need a button, right? So button click me gets button. Its parent is app. And its text is click me. You know, there's two ways to guarantee that a button gets clicked. You say, don't click me or launch the missiles. And you know they'll click it. OK, it's not there yet. Button, click me. Grid. And boom, there it is. So not a gorgeous UI, but I built a UI basically in front of you. Now, it's not doing anything yet. Right? I mean, I can type stuff in there. That's my name in Swedish. Um, oh, I killed the whole thing. I cannot believe I did that. All right, well. Uh, I'll show you. I've got the code. I can reshow it to you. Um, then how do you attach some sort of a function to the button? Well, you can write a function. You can run the function. You can attach the function to the button. Um, and that's all good news. That's all good. In fact, let me exit out. Um, here it is. Uh, no. I know, Vim, I'm just telling you. Um, there you can see a version of it that I could actually save. The problem with this is um, doing it live has lots of problems. For one, we have scope issues. For another, um, 
Figuring out how to attach the function to the button is quite ugly. Uh, thirdly, we really need some object-oriented programming around here. Um, so in order to actually teach this, I throw an object framework around it and treat it kind of Java-ish. And we can get a workable, runnable GUI very quickly. That's the great news. And so I was like, boom, I'm done, TK. That's my answer. Until you try to get to something a little more interesting. Um, last night, I really did teach how to exit Vim. I was just laughing at myself, because that actually was my lesson last night. Uh, all right, so let's look at something more interesting, um, the grade calculator. So there is a more complete GUI. You can see we can do text formatting. We can do all this stuff. At some level, this is making my students really happy when they see this part. Oh, I want to be able to make that. That's pretty cool. It sure does look like very old school, which is true. <laughs> but it's workable. It does the job. The reason that they're not so much in love with it is that the code gets nasty. It doesn't take long for things to get very, very weird in TK. And that's OK, except I find myself, well, hi, Gabby, how are you? I find myself always apologizing for this tool, because it made some assumptions that made a lot of sense in 2001 when TCL was a hot thing. Um, like, it borrows most of its ideas about how to put things in the grid from using tables as an HTML layout mechanism. That's how old school we are here. And I'm like, please let none of them notice this. Um, but that's kind of how I was doing things. Um, the fact that it, it got me to some really scary moments here. Remember, this is a CS1 class. How come when you call this one function, you don't use parentheses? Well, I'm not calling the function. I'm using it as a value. I'm passing a function by value. This is, oh dear, I do not want to get into functional programming today. But that's what we're doing. It's a first class citizen function. I'm like, oh, that's a rabbit trail. I'm not sure. Some of these kids are still having trouble with variables. Um, or sooner or later when you start doing this, you have to start dealing with lambdas, which is an awesome thing. I love it, maybe not in CS1. Um, so it doesn't take long before you get yourself uh, messing around with lambdas and messing around with all kinds of other crazy, crazy things. Um, also, as you dig in, it's really inconsistent. You know, in order to change, um, in order to get the text value of a label, you read the text property as an associative array lookup or a hash lookup. If you want to get it from the text entry, you have to call the get method. And the get method returns a pseudo string, which isn't really a Python string, but it can be converted. Integers are way worse. And so there's all these weird things that keep coming up. Um, and it looks ugly. And here's the worst things. The whole reason they wanted to do this was so they could show off. And nobody's going to be able to see their code unless they have a copy of Python installed. And sadly, many grandmas do not. I think they're moving in that direction. Um, I make that joke, but one of my favorite grandmas actually also wrote the best data structures book I've ever seen, and she makes me feel stupid when I eat lunch with her. Uh, um, so, of course, the natural thing, being a curious little brain, was I wonder if we could do web apps. I know we could do web apps in Python, but as I started experimenting with that, that sounded a lot worse. And there's a lot of reasons, because every time I say that to somebody, including even Calvin, they give me helpful advice. Just use Django. Just use Pyramid. Just use Flask. Because this whole just use thing, I start to look at it, and I'm going to have to explain this in the same amount of time that I had in the calendar for TK. Because they won't let me change the length of the semester. And on top of that, now I've also got to teach HTML and CSS, which, by the way, is still not a formal part of our curriculum. 
You can get a, a bachelor's degree in computer science without ever having to learn HTML and CSS. Turned out to not be a problem, because all of our students pick it up anyway, it's not hard. But now I've integrated it twice in the curriculum, so it's there. Um, so web apps get complicated fast. Many of you know this from real life, right? And all of these frameworks and things that we learn are wonderful, except they have their own ecosystem, they have their own language, they have their own culture, and often just getting into those is hard. Um, I can't expect them to have any HTML or CSS experience, or worse, they might have it. And then I got a bad, lot of bad habits to unteach. Um, I can't make it harder than TK. I can't take more time than I took in TK. Um, it has to be easy to install and maintain. Again, I'm not controlling their computers. I don't even know what they have. Um, it sure would be nice if I could teach some modern paradigms, a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of modern stuff, and maybe even kind of work our way towards progressive web apps. That would be pretty cool, yeah? A miniature version of it. So this is all compromise. But yep, we went with bottle. I know. Every time I bring it up to Python, people they are like, what kind of an amateur are you? And, and I, I'm OK with that. Um, let me explain what I'm thinking about. Now, so, some of you don't even know what it is, right? But you get it, right? Bottle is like a little flask. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a micro flask, basically. And what there's one thing about it I truly love above all things. In order to install it, you take bottle.py and you drop it in the same directory. That's it. Works with Python 2, works with Python 3. I have yet to have a single student who could not install bottle. That makes me very happy, <laughs> because now that's one excuse that's gone. There's some other things as I started using it I really liked, because it is very small. And in development, in commercial development, you want all the tools. You want everything. But in teaching, I don't want too many choices. I want it to be something that is containable and manageable so that there's some chance that I can get the TAs to all say the same thing. Um, and so I actually like the fact that it doesn't have a lot of choices. You know, most web frameworks come with four different templating engines, right? I only want one. Make it simple. I don't want to have discussions about whether we should be using Jinja or what. Um, so the routing system is basic and straightforward. Comes with its own basic server. Um, and uh, best of all, it's built into Python Anywhere, so when I walk them through a Python Anywhere installation, boom, it's there. Their code is live. I'm not running the server. I'm not worrying about what their server or their machine can do. So that makes me super happy. One of the hard decisions we had to make is, OK, so how are we going to teach these web technologies, right? HTML and CSS, even though they're simpler than programming languages, can take a long time to teach well. I got a day. Maybe two. And so we had to pick a subset of web technologies that we would do. And the basic idea we focused on was let's just do a subset of things um, that would focus on more HTML than CSS. Let's look at how much we had in TK and be able to do the things we did in TK. That's kind of what I'm going for. So I want a subset of HTML that gives me some basic widgets, basic input, output, basic layout. We don't have to go into the other stuff. If they're good computer science majors and I give them this much, they better be able to find the rest. Two of them are here in this room. Do I get an amen? <laughs> so I'm not going to bore you with these. I will say I did reluctantly go with grid as a layout mechanism. That's all I teach, because I can do a subset of grid in 10 minutes that'll work for just about every form and look good. Um, but what? You're not teaching them multi-platform web development. What about IE? Uh, yeah, let's just, yeah, you know what I'm going to say about IE. So then let's take a look at how the whole Python thing fits in there. Um, and again, all of this stuff is free. You can have any of it. You can, you can look at all these. I'll make the slideshow public. Um, 
So we'll take a look. Where do I have this here? There is Python Anywhere. Even the free version, you can have a web app. And I got one going there. We look at the file system. And this one, of course, I've been teaching with, so it's a little complicated. But when you do, do the default wizard installation, it creates a MySite directory. It creates a bottle app.py. This is the default one. And so the Python code, kind of crazy easy here. All we're doing is we're importing bottle and we're bringing in a couple of useful modules. Um, and like most uh, micro frameworks, it's using route decorators. Uh, so this is your classic controller. Um, right now, the only route I'm doing is hello world. And then you connect that route to a function. It can be any Python function. The most interesting thing is whatever string that Python function returns is displayed as HTML back to the browser. And so obviously, I could just write code here. That's pretty boring, but we could. And then you see line 9, that runs that microserver. It's not going to be suitable for uh, development, for, for real production, but for practicing, terrific. And I don't own it. So I don't have to answer emails 3 o'clock in the morning and be frantic people who can't get their homework done because they crashed their server. Um, <laughs> most of teaching is about figuring out how it's the student's fault, not yours. Okay, so that's pretty good. Of course, that's not the one I went with. Mine got a little bit more elaborate. Uh, let me show you. I have actually several of these running. Um, so you have the router, and I'll show you a more specific one. I had a better one. Here's one. Of course, I have a bunch of them open here. Where did I do that controller? OK, so there is an actual controller that I'm using for a couple of interesting things. And on there, you can see I have several route statements. You can also use a, a post decorator to attach a route to some sort of a post. There's get, of course. Um, and so the router simply allows me to um, do what they normally do, and that is intercept a URL and uh, pass control to the appropriate sub functions. Um, and so as you can tell, typically what we'll do for all these, I could do full-blown Python and in some of my other examples I do, but typically what I'll do is I'll return the results of this template function. And of course, most of you probably have done some of this, right? So a template function is going to use a templating engine to allow me to write pseudo HTML that's got Python embedded. That's where the magic really happens. So I teach plain HTML with no Python first. And then we get to these guys, and we start writing these templates. Now, the template engine in Bottle is really nice. Um, you save them as .html files, but they're not HTML files. They're really Python files. They're read into the Python interpreter. And if it doesn't see any special characters, it spits it out as HTML, CSS. It just returns it through. But it's watching for these special characters. Any line that begins with the percent sign is turned into Python code, and the Python interpreter reads it. Any block that's within the slash percent uh, symbols, that becomes a block of Python code. It is also interpreted by the Python interpreter. This is whether it's in the head, whether it's in the body, anywhere. So. If it doesn't see any of these, it reads as it's plain HTML or CSS or even JavaScript. Yikes, you want to go there with beginners? Let's try. Um, so uh, then the double mustaches is one of my favorite things. You can put that anywhere. And as long as the code inside that um, uh, becomes a Python string, that Python string will be output. So most often what you do is use variables. So any variable that can be evaluated to a Python string, you can put that directly in the code. I'll show you some examples. Um, one thing about writing the Python here that's a little tricky. Now think about it. You already know what our non-Python friends think of us, right? They're like, seriously, could you have a close brace? Indentation, come on. And generally, my argument to that is if you thought indentation was optional in C++, you didn't have me as a teacher. 
Uh, indentation was never optional. I'm fine with it being a feature of the language, although I kind of do wish we had the end statement, especially in a situation like this, because I insist that your HTML code be properly indented. I insist that your CSS be properly indented. Now you've got Python inside these things. Whose indentation do you use? That gets really ugly really fast. So one thing that a number of template engines do now is that in the context of templates, every block has an explicit end statement. And I actually really like it. it did, am I going to lose my Python card for admitting that I like an end statement? Um, but it actually is nice. The only problem I have is I'll forget which form of Python am I in. Do I suddenly need the end statement? Um, but it's actually quite nice. I'll show you some examples. Um, here's a couple. I've got so much open right now. Let me close some things that we've already seen. All right. There we go. Watch it not run. You know, that's how it works. Um, so I'm running on the Python Anywhere server, and of course it worked a moment ago. We'll see what's happening. All right, I'll try this one too. I have two of them running. All right, this one's working, so it's a little, um, it's a little different. Um, so very, very basic stuff. There's a hello world. That's the one we just saw. Um, this one's interesting. Hello name. What's interesting here is I've got it so that I could type anything. And it'll read that as a variable and utilize it in the output. Um, so those are kind of neat. Um, why is this one still loading? Interesting. OK. Because I had some of the same things. I had a BMI working on the other server, but that's fine. Uh, let's do um, something more sophisticated. Let's do this one, uh, a login. So there's your classic login form, right? Uh, so what's your name, Andy? What's your password? None ya business. OK, we'll submit. Wrong password, so obviously I'm going to get the email. Um, so let's take a look at this thing and see how it's going. Wow, the easy one is gone. But you always do backups. All right, so I'll look at the files for this. And when you look under my site, you can see. Um, Here's the views. And we'll go with this really simple one, this uh, uh, form.html. What's the one that asks for username and password? Very standard HTML. I love that. Notice I didn't even use CSS here. Don't care at this point. That's extra credit. Um, yeah, make it pretty, but make it work first, huh? If it's pretty and it doesn't work, I don't care. Um, so then that routes to this process form.html. And you can see that it's also HTML, but I've just embedded a little bit of Python code to give it conditional results. So that's a really wonderful thing, especially if by this point the students are already comfortable in Python. They're like, can't I put Python on my HTML? And the answer is, yep, you sure can. And it's pretty exciting, because now our web page has conditional logic. Well, that's not the best thing. The, the best thing is, I want to get them to a point where after the very first class in computer science, they can build a small but working CRUD app. Because if we can get there, they're going to be employable. I mean, I've had students get employed after the first year. That's way too early. <laughs> but 
we can take this thing all the way to a workable CRUD app. I did some dirty tricks to make the source code visible. No, it isn't normally. I had to write my own little secret source router. Um, but there's my view context. Now, actually, one of my rules is when you teach a public uh, you know, a database with a publicly available database, you never do what I just did. Just click on the view context because you know somebody will put something filthy in there. That's why I also do something that you never see in commercial programming, and that is I have a clear entire contact table database or button. So kill the whole thing. Yeah, generally for commercial programming, you shouldn't have a stealth destruct feature on the front page, but hey, whatever. I'm not going to judge. So there's the view contacts, and it uh, doesn't matter really which database we're using, but um, here's the view contacts, and you can see this is really quite elegant. Most of it is HTML. The fun part is I'm pulling in my, uh, the, uh, I'm using SQLite because why not, it's easy. Um, I can, uh, pulling in C, C is my connection. Um, execute an SQL query on that. And then I can, I will have as a result, uh, result, and I can parse through the records, and I can print each record's value. This is the easiest way to do a web-enabled database I have ever seen in my life. Um, and I can get even school teachers to do this. That's what I did this summer for my summer vacation. I went to Illinois and taught teachers who are wrestling coaches and shop teachers and home ec teachers who were suddenly told they're going to teach programming. <laughs> I taught them this in three days. Now, they work their tails off, and they are my heroes. Um, but in three days, I was, okay, six days. This was the second of two three-day seminars. Uh, they were able to build a web-enabled database. That's pretty exciting. Now their principals are like, crap, they're going to get a real job. That's the problem. And I like the problem. I welcome it. Let's make teachers too expensive to keep. Um, so there's a classic ad contact, and, of course, that has two two pieces, you know, you gather the data and then you have to, to manage it. Here you can see sort of my, uh, my router for the whole thing. This is beautiful. This is a side effect I wasn't expecting. To be able to teach them this multi-file programming that actually runs through a central controller, we're kind of, I wasn't really planning on doing MVC here, but we kind of are. And so what a beautiful thing. I wasn't really, um, that uptight about, about that, but it's a beautiful thing that they're seeing that this is a pattern that makes sense. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. Um, and they're seeing that we're building a little API, or we could very easily convert this to an API. And that's pretty exciting too, because that's leading them more than I really planned on towards modern paradigms of programming. So that's pretty exciting. Um, they have to see how to pass information between multiple files in a semi-complicated system. Um, but they're getting it. They're doing it. Um, and of course, we get to talk about other fun stuff like um, you know, sanitation of your inputs and uh, SQL injection attacks and all that sort of fun stuff. So uh, that little crud app, crud app is a lot of fun because by the end, they can add, they can uh, modify, they can um, delete, they can search, and they can build it on their own database. Now, I'm going single table right now, but I always have people who are ready for multiple tables. And so I usually end up having to do a data normalization lecture. They ask me for it. They're like, I'm trying to do my CDs, it's not working. I'm like, yeah, I know it's not working. Today's the day we learn data normalization, and I have no kidding, had people ask me to come do a special session just on that. Um, so that's pretty, pretty good news. Um, it's not perfect. It's not been a perfect solution. Now, several of the things that I wanted to accomplish, I think we did. What's really exciting is I am seeing these kids take these things, and I taught them just enough PWA so you can put it on your, on your phone, and it won't show the browser menu, and it has an icon. To them, it's an app. And I, I'm good with it. Great, it's an app. Who cares? Is it only an app if it went through the App Store? Have we gotten there? I don't know. 
Um, but okay, so they can, they can make it work. They can show it to grandma. They can um, get this stuff out. And honestly, that was one of Python's biggest problems, really, was deployment. And so web app is deployable. Um, dealing with static files like external CSS, JavaScript, and images does require some care. So I had to teach a little bit about how to set up a static directory. Um, they have to deal with file management. Um, which is a great thing to learn, but before we were doing every program was one file. Uh, until you get to CS2, we're writing C++ code, and they were totally lost. Well, now we're doing that earlier with this, so that's good. Um, surprising thing, people do not know how to run their browsers properly. I can't tell you how many times I've seen 75 tabs open, and people can't find anything. Of course, you're laughing because I just did it. Um, but people have all these tabs open, so we have to teach them tab discipline. Um, one of the hardest things for them to see is the errors aren't going to pop up anywhere. They'll know, cool, no errors. Like, post-it note over the check engine light. The problem, of course, is that errors will happen, and those errors will be registered to an error log, and you have to look that up on the server. So that freaks people out a little bit until they realize, look, we're not telling the users what the errors are. You know, there's that terrifying moment where it just reports there's an error, you need to contact the server administrator. And at first you're like, cool, not my fault. Oh crap, I am the server administrator. Um, so that, that's a hard thing to teach. Um, but the advantages are, are, are great. Um, HTML and Python, and to a lesser extent CSS, they are a joyous combination. Really, they really fit together so, so well. HTML and CSS is a terrific UI interface. And Python is a terrific language. They fit together really well. Um, we can get to mobile apps, which really excites the students. Um, we're teaching some really nice adjunct skills. And let's face it, you know, today, the web is the GUI that matters. Really, and mobile is web. They really have converged so much just in the last few years. Um, and uh, so it's, it's pretty great. And then there's a few little technical tricks. So if you end up wanting to do this, let me know. I'll give you some other things. There were some things I couldn't do, like I couldn't show source code. So I wrote my own route where I can route through a source code shower. I can give it the name of a file, and it'll just print it out as source. And a few other little tricks like that I had to Sometimes uh, interesting things come up, like uh, wanting to upload images. So I have some special things on that. One thing they can't do here, which I'm going to call an advantage, real-time games. How am I going to write World of Warcraft with monkeys with this system? And the answer is a glorious you won't. I love gaming. I teach gaming. The worst thing a beginner can do, and they all do it anyway, is try to write a game. Um, the fact that we can't write games with this system has saved so many students so much grief. Um, and they have no idea. They think I'm being mean. Um, but the fact that gaming is not, is not feasible except, okay, we can do yet another Dungeons & Dragons character generator. I got a great idea. Pokedex. I'm going to do a Pokedex. Oh, I've never seen that the last 30 years. Okay. Um, but yeah, they can do that stuff. And they can have fun, but it actually keeps them from doing some stuff they're probably not ready for anyway. Um, so that's good stuff. Um, great. You got questions? Surely you do. Anybody? Oh. Anybody got questions for Andy? There's one back there. Let me uh, give you the mic. That way it gets on the recording. Uh, very nice talk. Do you uh, do anything to to teach or suggest that they develop tests for their code? Oh, yes, yes. Um, we do some testing. I do a lot more testing in the second course than in the first course because the second course is entirely object-oriented. So um, unit testing just makes so much sense there, and, and it integrates. So I have played around with trying to get testing in the first class. The, the problem with teaching isn't deciding what to teach. It's deciding what not to teach. Um, that's what's really, really hard, and that's agonizing. That you know, I'd like to see more testing there. We do some, um, but we've got more in the second class, and I know they're going to get a whole class in it later. 
so I'm not too concerned about not running formal tests. Now, here's the other truth, right? All of their code's gonna go through a system we wrote, which is a test checker. So in a sense, um, some of these people right here are my testing suite because they're the TAs and graders. Cool. Any other questions for Andy? Awesome. We'll give Andy a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being with us.